here any second. All right, hey, welcome everyone um, into uh, our next Rev War Revelry. Uh, we have a treat with you. It's actually almost on the anniversary of the battle. Uh, we're going to talk about Brandywine and the Brandywine campaign. Um, so today we are joined, of course, by uh, one of our great ERW historians, Billy Griffith. Um, we might have saw last week talking about Arnold. Um, and we're also joined by uh, probably one of the preeminent knowledgeable historians on the Battle of Brandywine, whose book here, uh, published by Savage J.D., um, came out a few years ago, and that's Michael uh, Harris. Uh, we thank you for joining us uh, from uh, tonight. And so um, I guess we'll get started. Uh, Michael Harris, of course, uh, the author, historian, um, great battlefield guide there, former Park Service historian, teacher. I think I nailed it all, right? Yeah, it's pretty good, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, there you go. So, um, but uh, welcome, Michael. And so our uh, first thing tonight is, of course, get us to Brandywine. Where is Brandywine and how does it fit into uh, the strategic picture? Okay, so basics, Brandywine is in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's, um, it's a river or creek, depending on who you ask. Um, but it's basically just north of the border uh, with Delaware. It's about uh, 20 miles, maybe southwest of Philadelphia. Um, just, you know, maybe 15 miles north of Del uh, Wilmington, Delaware, that kind of puts it in perspective. Um, how the Army's got there, real basic. Um, so after Trenton and Princeton, um, both armies go into winter quarters in North Jersey or New York City. Washington has to rebuild his army. Um, you have some initial maneuvering up there in the spring of 77 in Northern New Jersey before um, how William Howe loads 18,000 personnel on the ships. Um, and then they sail around the Delmarva Peninsula and land in Northeastern Maryland, uh, near where Elkton, Maryland is today on August 25th, 1777. During that time, Washington slowly moved south with the Continental Army, at least the, um, his, his contingent of the Continental Army, because keep in mind, this is the same time as the Saratoga campaign. Um, and then there's some maneuvering through North, Northeastern Maryland, a minor engagement in Delaware at a place called Cooch's Bridge on September 3rd. And then you have the Battle of Brandywine on September 11th after both armies maneuvered across the Pennsylvania line on the 9th and 10th of September. So that's how they got to Brandywine. All right, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, um, that engagement in Delaware, is that the only Red War engagement in the colony state? I mean, there's some minor skirmishing, but in terms of a, yeah, it's actually the largest battle in the history of Delaware. Oh. <laughs> um, there's some more of 1812 minor stuff on the coast, but um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's the main one. Okay, so at the banks, um, uh, before we continue on the Brandywine, Billy, anything uh, to chime in at the, the beginning here? about? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to uh, ask Mike's opinion on this. Um, you mentioned the Saratoga campaign is going on at the same time. Now, John Burgoyne comes up with that big plan for the two-pronged thrust uh, towards Albany that's going to sever New England off and potentially end the war um, in favor of the British. Uh, however, William Howe has a plan to not link up with Burgoyne, but move and capture Philadelphia. Now, everything that I've read, people always put blame on Howe abandoning Burgoyne during these operations, but the orders that are given to him are really kind of discretionary. How only thinks it's a suggestion, right? Not necessarily a plan that needs to be implemented. Only because they were never uh, dispatched. When the orders were written, they were pigeonholed. They got put into a clerk's desk um, at the war office and um, Lord, uh, oh, on a blank, I can't think of that. Anyway, the guy who was supposed to, the, the Lord that's in charge. Germain. Germain, thank you, thank you. Lord Germain was leaving for his country estate and never forced the issue to make sure they got out in the dispatches. The order would have actually told him if he was going to go to Philadelphia, he had to get back in time to assist Burgoyne. But that order was never actually sent. So, okay. so Hal's interpretation is he has some discretion. I actually think he knew, I mean, the, the, the plan to divide the colonies, the New England colonies along the Lake Champlain-Hudson River corridor was not a new plan. It wasn't something Burgoyne invented. 
I mean, that was the whole reason they captured New York in 1776. That was like phase one, because they needed the southern mouth of the, of the Hudson. So it wasn't like it was a new plan that was being created. Hal was aware of it. Um, I, I think initially Hal thought he could get to Philly and back in time to send the contingent north to Albany. But all that changes when he decides to not come up the Delaware River and go around the Delmarva. The moment he makes that decision, there's no way he's helping Burgoyne. Mm-hmm. For that, or is it even defeated when he's shadow boxing Washington and what, northern New Jersey for weeks before he even gets on board? To transport, uh, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, you get I mean, if you look at the game, yes, the, all the playing around and the games he played up in northern New Jersey doesn't help. But uh, if you look at when they tack into the mouth of the Delaware Bay, which is on July, I think it's 30th, um, at that point, there's no Continental Army. In, New Jer- in Pennsylvania, they're still in Jersey. There is no, um, nobody in the forts along the Delaware River, there, except some militia. Um, there's no Continental Navy to stop them from coming up the river. He could have landed in Chester or Wilmington and marched to Philadelphia and within two days, and there wasn't a thing Washington could have done about it. When he made that choice to go back out to sea, there was no, there was no way. There was no way he was, because if he had gotten Philly, say he was in Philly by August 5th, there's still a chance he can return to Burgoyne um, by the end of August, you know, leaving a garrison in Philadelphia. And I guess his uh, kind of effort to aid Burgoyne by sending uh, Clinton up the Hudson Islands in October, a little, little too little too late. Yeah, and I don't even know if he actually gave that order to Clinton or Clinton. He orders him back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Clinton does that on his own. Mm-hmm. Well, um, so I'm always impressed. I'm, I'll admit it, and everyone who's tuned in always, always already knows this, that I'm a Maryland homer. So um, I've tracked the, the Army from the head of elk and all that in. Um, but I, we have a very loyal uh, listener, Rob Ryan, who is a Delawarean. So I had to mention uh, if that was the largest battle in That's Delaware. Far, huh? way, um, he's there. <laughs> um, so they're coming up. Um, um, into uh so why for people who don't know why brandywine creek if it's not a creek it's not a river why oh why that's not? a good no that's a good question so in the 18th century it's a major geographical obstacle so if you're trying to get to philadelphia once they maneuver beyond the um the christiana and the red and white clay creeks in northern delaware the next natural barrier to defend philadelphia is the schuylkill i mean i'm sorry is the brandywine if they don't defend the Brandywine, they have to defend the Schuylkill River, uh, which, if, for those of you that aren't familiar with the geography, runs literally right next to Philadelphia, um, which I cover in my new book on Germantown because that's what's going to happen after Brandywine. So, um, I mean, it was a barrier. You couldn't just, it wasn't a stream that you could hop over. In the 18th century, the fords were chest deep. So if you, you think about the fords being chest deep, the main river is over your head. So it was an obstacle. If you go there now, I mean, you could walk across it almost everywhere. I kayak it every summer. I mean, it's not, it doesn't look like an obstacle now, but it was in the 18th century. And so the theory was if you could block all the roads that lead to the fords, well, how can't get to Philadelphia? That was the theory. But they don't block all the fords, correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we'll get started because this may lead up to some comments. Uh, if you're watching on uh, Facebook here, feel free to um, post some comments. But um, so Brandywine is uh, George Washington orders the blocking of all the Fords except ones that he doesn't know about. So how much is he to, to blame for that? So, I mean, the locals play a part in in that part of it, correct? Yeah, the locals are going to help the British Army a lot. Um, what, I mean, I mean, I, there's multiple failures on, on, the, on the headquarters staff level. I mean, they arrive along the Brandywine the afternoon and evening of September 9th. So they have at least one full day to scout the terrain. There is at least one regiment of line um, that was from that region of Pennsylvania. His division commander, one of them, Anthony Wayne, lived, I'm trying to think what the distance is, it's not far, five, six miles away. There's several uh, um, field officers of, of line regiments that live within the county. It's not like there weren't people with the army that didn't know the roads and didn't know the local population. He just utterly fails to use those resources 
to make sure he knows the road network. It's, it's not so much a terrain issue, I don't think. He just, he's completely unfamiliar with the road network. And I think it's inexcusable. Well, um, does, is there any, I mean, I've never come across, uh, you have more detail than I am, uh, any writing of why, uh, what happens in that day or two, I mean, besides what's put in your book, about why he doesn't take advantage of it? Um, well, I, he, I think he, the, the, the quote he, after the battle in his after action report, when he writes to Congress, he says, um, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase because I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically says, uh, we did, something along the lines of we didn't watch the other Fords because we thought they were, I don't know if he says too far, I can't remember the exact quote, but basically he thought there was no way how could get to those because they were too far out of the area of operation. But he basically was given bad information. Um, I mean, obviously Hal does use them. Um, I, I don't understand why he doesn't just send a patrol up there to keep an eye on it. I, I mean, throughout the day of the 10th, there's a lot of like minor skirmishing that occurs between the two armies, um, but it's mostly down along um, where, where US Route 1 crosses the river today at Chad's Ford. And so I think Washington just utterly convinced himself that that's where the main action was gonna be. That's where all the pre-battle skirmishing and scouting patrols from both armies were. I, you know, he did have troops up like about eight miles up his right flank, but beyond there, he didn't have anybody, and that's where Hal goes. And is that because of a lack of cavalry, a lack of just, I mean, focusing on? We always hear that, uh, and that you you shouldn't expect the enemy to do what you, you want the enemy to do. But mm -hmm. it seems that Brandywine that that's what Washington wants Hal to do is to stay in that one theater and and ignore yeah. what uh, is outside uh, the curfew. He has cavalry. There's there's about 800 horse with the army, so it's not like a lack of. He has he has four times as much horse as, as the British, so it, it's not like there's a lack of resources. He just and the other part that doesn't make any sense is it's not like Hal had never done it before. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it wasn't a new maneuver. I mean Hal does it to him at least at least four times before Brandywine, the exact same thing. So I, I don't know. I, you know, Washington doesn't really talk about it other than that brief line in the report to John Hancock. You know, I don't. He doesn't bring it. It's almost he moves on. Let's you know next problem. Yeah, I mean, you can't blame him, I guess, because next yeah. few weeks there's a few more problems that unfold. But yeah, um, it's amazing for a gentleman to spend so much time on a lot of his other failures, on the French and Indian War and and so forth. That there's not much about. For anyone, uh, so the, I mean, the armies get there, and it's it's a large engagement. Um, I've heard it's what the, I think you said it's the largest combined forces on both sides, and any one engagement in the war. And is that more than I was at Yorktown? Yeah, it's bigger in terms of. I mean, the armies are bigger at Long Island, but they're not all engaged. Um, it's def it's bigger than Monmouth, and it's Yorktown. The armies are really not that big. Um, actually, there's more French troops at Yorktown than America. Um, but the British force here is very small. So, yeah, I mean, you're talking, there's about 30 to 31,000 troops at Brandywine. Yeah, it's big. So, um, uh, and uh, Billy, feel free to uh, chime in here. I know I don't want to uh, clog all the time here. I have a, a million questions because Brandywine is. Uh, one is interesting, I mean, and I'm not even going to touch Ferguson yet, because I know that uh, uh, that's not there yet. <laughs> conversation, but um, yeah, before we uh, move on from into the day of the battle, um, open it up. Uh, we don't have any questions yet on, on Facebook, but um, pass over to Billy here. Yeah, um, Washington's missing a pretty important element of his army at this point, and that's Daniel Morgan's uh, riflemen who have been sent north to assist uh, the Northern Army. Um, but thinking about it, I, I always thought maybe, you know, Morgan's men could have played more in intelligence gathering for Washington had they been there. But when Morgan's gone, they form up a new kind of core of light infantry under Maxwell that I think was serving basically in the same, uh, you know, capacity that Morgan's men would have been by yeah. moving across Chad's Ford and kind of just serving as like a forward screen almost. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, that's not inaccurate. I mean, yeah, I mean, you got it. Abs that's absolutely right, Billy. So. Yeah, I mean, I can't really add to that. You got it pretty correct. <laughs> well, 
Is, am I correct or wrong that I mean Maxwell comes under a little bit of heat for his actions, or is that? Yeah, he he's one of he's one of four officers that get court-martialed um, in the aftermath of Germantown. He's court-martialed for drunkenness at Brandywine and the Battle of Clouds, and exonerated. Um, but the guy that brings the charges to him is kind of self-serving. He's kind of pissed that he didn't get the. It's um it's William Heth, uh, Virginia line. Who serve, he serves under um, Maxwell in the light infantry. And I think he's kind of irked that he didn't get to go with Morgan when Morgan went north. And then he gets stuck with this, what he considered an inept officer. Um, but if you really look at what Maxwell does at um, Brandywine and Bow the Clouds, he did exactly what Washington asked him to do. He was a screening force to slow down the advance of the, art, uh, the enemy. And he did exactly, he wasn't supposed to stop them. He did exactly what he was supposed to do the morning of the battle. Um, you know, so I think there was just some head hunting because he was d disgruntled for the position he was in when he didn't get to go north. And his, his nickname was already Scotch Willie, so it made for an easy target. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if they captured everyone that was drinking in, uh, in the Continental Army at that general command, I mean, I think there would there wouldn't be that many left that uh, would still be standing. I mean, yeah. especially that uh, the winner that came up in, in, in Valley Forge. Um, yeah. But I mean, uh, so we're, okay, we're at the, the banks of um, um, the, the Brandywine. So we'll get into the, into the gauge for now. So it starts, um, and how do you pronounce this guy's name? Not Nipphausen, Nipphausen? Uh, it's Ken Nipphausen. Ken Nipphausen. All right. So, <laughs> His goal is what to keep Washington in place as the main force uh, curves around. Yeah, he's like a whole. He he's a diversion. Right. You know, hold Washington in place while the the long flank march can 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 uh, uh, go to fruition. I guess is the word yeah. because they have a seventeen mile march. It's it's going to take them a while. Um, okay. Yeah. Since I didn't realize seventeen. I mean, that's, uh, you think about the march. Um, and I know uh, Mark Malloy, who is a, uh, one of the ERW authors, uh, would want me to throw this in here because he's a Civil War nut. I mean, it's kind of like, so can Nip, Pop, Nip Pauzen, or however you pronounce his name, yeah. kind of like the uh, Robbie Lee of Chancellorsville, since some of us have connections to it's that. Very, it's actually and, very similar. I don't remember that. It's been a while since I worked at Chancellorsville. I don't remember the distance, but it's a very similar concept. Very I similar. I think it's 70 miles. What was that? I think it's 17 miles that Jackson's yeah, been covered close. as well. I know it's in the teens and everything. They come out. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and it's pretty much, is it the same type of shock when the divisions come out? Um, I mean, because you got what Cornwallis and Howe are both there. So what, the number one and two commanders. So yeah. I mean, it shows the importance. Um, it'd be similar to sending Lee and Jackson on, on Jackson's flank come out and letting, I don't know, yeah. um, Longstreet or whatever, the third left back at, uh, at, in the diversion. So, yeah. yeah. It really shows, I mean, I guess Washington had no idea that Howe and Cornwallis weren't still in front of him then. No, he doesn't realize it. Well, there's there's conflicting intelligence that, that reach him between starting about 9.30 in the morning until about 1.15 in the afternoon. There's all these conflicting reports. You'll get one report that says there's nobody out there, and then you'll get a report that they could see dust clouds moving to the right. Um, and so there's, there's, that's another failure at the headquarters is the inability to interpret that intelligence and who's delivering the intelligence, the timing of the intelligence, who you choose to send to confirm the intelligence. There was a whole series of, of levels of, of mistakes at, at headquarters level um, throughout the midday hours. Um, Cause it's about 115, well, that it's written. So he probably doesn't get it till Push into two o'clock, the confirmation that they're across the Brandywine behind his right rear. And then uh, what happens then? They rush. They <laughs> rush three divisions to try to confront that force um, on at an area known as Birmingham Hill, which is about two miles northwest of Chad's Ford, so kind of behind the right rear. Um, they rush three divisions up there, and two of those divisions get in place. And one of them's in the middle of maneuvering to get in the place when the attack is launched. So, um, 
Uh, you know, there's questions. I mean, um, you, the divisions that sent up there are led for, by pretty competent officers, or I mean, because or what, what's your opinion? I know what it's all. Well, <laughs> yeah, let's throw the opinions on all. Uh, well, I mean, what Washington has as its command to try to help the Washington followers placate some of the blame that uh, the officers he has to command. Well, the three that go up there really don't do anything wrong. Right, so it's Adam Stephen, which he actually doesn't fight bad at Brandywine, but he's the one that gets cashiered from the army for drunkenness at Germantown. But I don't really feel like he does anything wrong at Brandywine. We could talk about Germantown some other time. Um, he sends Lord Sterling, um, who's actually William Alexander, the Lord thing, sort of a false title, um, who, who's a competent officer. I mean, he's, he's going to be around for the whole war. And then John Sullivan. Now, John Sullivan is going to get an inordinate amount of blame for what happens up there. Um, but I feel looking at the primary sources and the court martial documents that come about, um, it's not Sullivan's fault. He's, a, he's just in a bad position up there because his division never actually got in place. They were in the middle of trying to wheel up onto this hill when they got struck, so they were never in line. And so because he gets swept away, a lot of blame gets directed to him by Congress and, and certain officers that weren't on the scene. Um, yeah, is that kind of... Yeah. yeah no, and, uh, the the British force that that's hitting the British force that's hitting the right flank uh, of Washington's army. These just aren't any regular British troops. This is the the cream of the crop yeah. for the yeah. men that now is serving with them. Yeah, it's um it's the Hessian Jaegers, it's the British Grenadiers, Hessian Grenadiers, British Light Infantry, British Brigade of Guards, um, and then they have a couple of brigades of regular British Infantry, but they're going to be in reserve until the very end of the fight. Um, so it's it's really the elite that are heading this line, yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost perfect then for the British. I mean, you have this flank attack and you're spearheading it with the guys you want. I mean, you don't use it. Usually, you get one of the two. Like you guys lead the assault if you want, or you have the the surprise flank attack. But for the British, it's the best of both then. Yeah, it was well. I mean, from Hal's point of view, the, it 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 couldn't have gone much more perfect. But it uh, so um. It, Backtracking a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe I, uh, being from Maryland, we love hopeless causes or something, um, being an Orioles fan and, and so forth. But uh, I feel like John Sullivan is one of those guys that's just hard luck wherever he goes in this war. I mean, when he's captured in what, New York, he's, they make a fool of him by sending him, what, to Congress to, for a peace thing. Yes. I think yes. he gets picked off with the French in, what, Rhode Island because of the failed assaults there. Um, but I mean, and then he does that campaign out west, what the Iroquois campaign that we're now yeah. looking at. But I mean, is the guy really, in your estimation, that bad of a leader? I mean, I, I, I mean, I haven't looked a ton at his outside 1777 stuff, so I I'm, couldn't wouldn't, don't want to consider myself an expert on all that. But what happens at Brandywine is not his fault. In fact, when his division collapses, he's not even commanding it. Um, when those three divisions were sent north. He was told to take command of that entire wing, which puts him in overall command of that three division front, almost like a, in a sense of core from civil war point of view. Um, and then that leaves in command of his own division, a guy, uh, a French officer named Prudhomme de Bore, who I would guess does not know much English, um, which if you look at his letter to Washington, um, his report on the battle, it's literally a mixture of French and English, which is ridiculous when you know that Washington can't read French. Um, so if that's how he's reporting to the commander in chief, how is he actually communicating with his officers? Especially um, when the guns start shooting. Yeah, um, so yeah. I think a lot of the reason Sullivan's own division, even though it's his division and his name is on it, he's not actually commanding it when it collapses. He's not with it. Um, so there's a lot, of, there's, you got to take into account that factor. And then at Germantown, I mean, he does exactly what he's supposed to do at Germantown, um, drives the British outposts in, uh, starts to penetrate their actual camp line. Um, what happens there is not his fault. It, it's something that happens behind him after he's, he's passed the, the chew house. Everything that goes wrong is behind him. Um, I mean, that's a topic for another day. So, you know, just looking at the 77 campaign, you know, it's hard to put a lot of blame on him um, and, and his division. 
you know, him specifically? I think the board doesn't he exit pretty quickly. He tries to ride across some type of river or stream later no, on. No, 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 no. That's um, that's a I'm different mixing, guy. Um, am I mixing up the French? You are yeah. asking up the French. The yeah, board does it, resign. Right. Go ahead, Billy. You remember who he's talking I about? I forget what his name is. He he tried to like ride his horse onto a ferry and like. Yeah, it, it happens. Um, it's the same day as the Battle of the Clouds. Um, yeah. Well, hold on. I Debore resigns. Okay. And goes back to France. Like. I want to say, like, just a couple days after the battle, he he resigns and leaves. The guy that rides onto the horse is the same guy that pissed off um, Henry Knox. Yeah, Knox and Green were going to resign. Yeah, because they were all going to resign because they made this guy commander of the artillery. Um, yeah, the scene, it's September 16th. He rides onto the ferry across the Schuylkill, and the horse rides right on up the other side, and he drowns. And I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Makes me want to look real quick. While you're thinking of the next question, I'm going to look him up. It was uh, Coudre. Uh, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. So for all of the board descendants, I apologize for slandering his name, saying he can rode a horse off a ferry. But um, um, so uh, well, let's start with segue. So um, we also see um, the emergence here, Brandywine, of another French leader, probably uh, one that is the most famous Frenchman. Um, I'll just call him Marquis de Lafayette because I know his name will take about two minutes to get through. Yeah. Uh, but is it he's wounded on this action, right? Up in this part of um, as Sullivan yeah. breaks, I think it is, because he's trying yeah. to rally. Yeah, so what happens is Sullivan, if you could kind of picture in your head going from west to east, this this Birmingham Hill front would have been Sullivan's division, Sterling's division in the middle, and Stevens division on the right flank. Well, Sullivan's division, his own division under DeBorey, collapses almost immediately, leaving just Sterling and Stephen in position. And they actually try to hold the line for a while uh, with those two divisions. And, you know, they probably put up about a 20 to 30 minute fight if I had to put a number on it. Um, but it's during that action that Lafayette's wounded riding along the back of Thomas Conway's brigade of Sterling's division. He's actually... And show you how in, in, inexperienced these guys are pre Valley Forge. He's actually riding down the line, helping them put their bayonets on um, from his, like, while he's on his horse. And he's on his horse and he gets shot through the thigh. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, up on the, it's up on this part of the fight. You're, that's correct. That is that. And uh, before we do move on, I have to admit that uh, Sullivan actually has probably the best regiment in, his whole, in the whole army, the 1st Maryland, is in, uh, under John Stone. Uh, there, mm -hmm. his uh, brother, I, I think John Stone does get wounded at Germantown, if I'm not mistaken, I think. He does. Uh, uh, he's wounded he at Brandywine, too. He's wounded at both. Because his brother is uh, a guy named Thomas Stone, I think, uh, or relation to Thomas Stone, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Thomas Stone was one of the Maryland signers. He is uh, just one of the smallest national parks in the uh, in the system. Uh, but it actually has an original copy of the Declaration of, uh, of Independence uh, there, the copy he gave to the Stone family. So. I have to give a shout out because one of the people watching is uh, my former boss there, uh, Scott Hill. So um, giving a shout out so people can visit uh, Thomas yeah. Center. Um, yeah, if you're ever in Southern Maryland, um, it's uh, right outside, right off 301 as you uh, go down. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen the signs yeah. for it, driving to Mary Washington all those years. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, definitely, yeah. So it became a national park in the night, late night or early 1980s, but didn't open until the 1990s. But enough about that. I just wanted to throw out the first Maryland <laughs> because um, um, I wouldn't be a homer if I wasn't. So the, um, the line, uh, so we're up there, um, the line collapsed. Now on the other side, um, Washington stays fixated down near Chad's Ford, correct? For most of the day, yes. Until, until pretty late, till about five o'clock in the afternoon or so before he starts riding up to the north, yeah. And while he's around the banks, um, do we, this is a good time to segue into Ferguson. Um, here at, uh, I mean, we, we've got to, right? We're, we're talking about Brandywine, and Ferguson <laughs> has him in his sights, supposedly, right? Uh, that's, the that's the story. That's um, the story. Where, where do you want to go with this? <laughs> um, it, uh, well, how, much, how, that, how much is fire and how much is smoke? Um, okay. The problem with the story is the only source of the story is Ferguson. Um, you know, he gets wounded. Not long after this supposed incident, 
um, he gets wounded, his elbow is shattered. Um, and he's in a hospital after the battle. And the letter he writes to his brother after the battle claims he's telling the story of having this officer in his sight. And he describes the officer as um, wearing a dark cloak and a remarkably high cocked hat um, and riding with um, an officer in Hussar dress, um, but didn't know who he was. And supposedly an American surgeon working on the wounded says, oh, well, that was Washington. Could it have been? Of course it could have been. Um, who's the guy in his sword dress? Probably Casimir Pulaski, who was an unattached officer on the staff at the time. Um, he doesn't get the cavalry command or after Brandywine. So I mean, it's possible um, the distances would work if you, you know, I have a, you know, you have, I have a general idea where, you know, Washington was the mor during the morning hours. Um, and you have a general idea where Ferguson could have been, you know, the distances aren't impossible with one of those Ferguson rifles having shot one at a range. They are pretty accurate up to 300 yards. Um, so it's not impossible, but you only have Ferguson's version. You know, they were both in the area for it to have happened. Did it happen? Who knows? You know. There's, there's probably a lot of other guys who would have saw Washington too and, and could have taken a shot as well. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, he does. He definitely comes under artillery fire. Mm -hmm. There's um, at the John Chad House, which is where Chad Ford gets his name from. He was uh, there's, that sits on like a knoll. If you've never been to the Brandywine area, and it overlooks the Brandywine River from the American side, and he was up there observing British artillery fire. And there's 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 a civilian account written in the Victorian era, which is you know is always questionable. But the nephew of, of Chad was supposedly in the basement of the Chad house looking out the window and he saw Washington come under artillery fire. Normally I would throw that out because it's Victorian, except James Parker, who's a loyalist traveling with the British army, is hanging out with British artillery officers and writes in his journal that he saw Washington through his glass because he lived not far from Mount Vernon, New Washington, what he looked like and told, it the, told the auditorily officers to redirect their fire. So if you take in the Parker's account combined with the nephew's account, there's probably some truth to that one. Um, it's just a Ferguson when there's no corroborating evidence. You know, you need that somebody to find something in their attic to, to see if there's another piece of the puzzle. You know, the, Washington was definitely riding the lines that morning. Um, it's not impossible that he could have been seen by Ferguson well, Ferguson could just as easily be describing some other officer, you know. I mean, it fits Washington's uh, mantle. I mean, he's uh, and as Billy knows, I mean, Washington has no problem riding right into the, the thick of an engagement um, anywhere. So, I mean, he is uh, up on the banks. Um, but uh, um, that's the other question. So, um, and I and I'm pretty sure I didn't read in your book, but uh, on the whole attack on Howe and the, the, the main, I mean, that's pretty much the main battle up there. Um, no artillery is is put on that field, correct? No, that's incorrect. You're talking oh, about up on up on Birmingham Hill? Yeah. Oh no, there's artillery up there. There's um, I think it's six or six American pieces, and then Hal has all his. Um, he doesn't have heavy artillery with that column, but all the battalion pieces. Most British battalions had two light pieces attached to them. So the light guns with the, the the light battalion guns would have been traveling with their battalions. That's that's even more impressive than that he's able to march 17 miles, bring artillery all across the fort, and get them onto the field of engagement. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, I mean, so luckily for I mean the Americans is that how fights at Brandywine because he doesn't support Burgoyne for the far the north. The bad part for the Americans is that how fights at Brandywine because of what happened. So. Yeah, um, yeah. I do want, uh, before we move on to the campaign or uh, other questions, I do want to ask, um, you have one of the, the greatest quotes um, you gave us for the post, is that the army doesn't fail Washington, Washington fails the army. Um, do you feel like to elaborate on that? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, at this point, my research is well into uh, late October of 77, because I'm actually crazy enough to start the third volume. Um, Every time, like, whatever Washington asked the army to do, these impossibly long marches, these crossing swift rivers, um, 
you know, tr you know, putting them in position to stand up the British regulars. They do it. It's just, is he putting them in the right position? Is he making the right decisions for them to succeed? That's where the campaign goes wrong. Because the army does what everything that's asked them through all, I mean, and that the camp, the, the miles that those troops put on over that three month period are insane. And they do it. Um, and they survive it. They, they do limp in the Valley Forge, but they did it. Um, so at no point is the army unwilling to do what he asks. He, they go wherever he sends them, but is he sending them and making the right decisions and putting them in the places for success? I would argue no. Are you know just at Brandywine or the whole campaign? I'm talking about the whole campaign. I mean, it starts at Brandywine, yes. But um, his decision-making along the Schuylkill River, I mean, we're getting into my, my new book, but his decision-making along the Schuylkill River, once again, he has to defend Fords to keep the British Army from crossing to get into Philadelphia. He's completely duped uh, and, and moves away from the Fords the British have to use. That's not the Army's fault. That's his decision. And then his decision at Cliveden to assault that house rather than bypass it, that's his decision. That's not the army. You know, it's repeatedly, he's re repeatedly making decisions that hurts the army. The army's not doing things that hurt him. So it's not, uh, so we, I've always heard that, of course, uh, at Cliveden, I mean, not going too far in the weeds, that it's Henry Knox that gives him the, uh, the push that says, yeah, I can subdue that house. Yeah, you got you got to read the new book, Phil. <laughs> um, I did. Yeah. I'm just trying to give a no, I'm, just, I'm teasing. Uh, no, I'm teasing. Uh, there, there is a heated argument between Pickering, Timothy Pickering, who's the adjutant general of the army, and Knox as the battle's raging at Germantown. Um, and there's Pickering leaves multiple letters letters on it after the after the war. Um, and then there's a lot of corroborating officers that were sort of within earshot. Um, there's a whole chapter on it. <laughs> I know. I was just trying to segue to uh, give you a chance to uh, the pencil book here, um, as they say, but um, which is coming out, uh, which has been published by Savas Beatty, uh, um, which should be coming out soon. So pay attention to the website there. There's a, the cover there, um, the great uh, image. I can, that's the iconic image from Germantown. Yep, one, but, of, uh, one of many. One of the, uh, the amazing issues, uh, the things I find about Brandywine is is the night after the battle. I mean, uh, as the army retreats and so forth, um, yeah, they hurry off the field, but it's not a New York scene, correct? It's not a, uh, I mean, it's a shambled unit. I mean, it's an army that felt like they fought well. Which yeah. Is, I mean, which is amazing because we think about, uh, we hear Washington's army, I mean, in New York, how they just kind of disintegrate as they leave the field. Or yeah. so forth. Um, but uh, what's the, uh, I mean, Let's, uh, let's only has a question and what's that so far. We've only got a few questions from our native Delawarean about different things. So we'll get to that at the end here. Um, one of them actually pertains to see if you're, you're knowledge in War of 1812 history uh, in the area. Um, but um, I'll throw it over to Billy. Um, any questions before we go into the campaign? Uh, yeah, this is just one, one thing that I was thinking about today while I was doing uh, my reading to prepare for this, but uh, it's, it's something surprising, never, never thought about, really never put two and two together. But when we see the Continental Army succeeding, at least Washington's main army, we'll keep the focus there. Um, they're succeeding while conducting offensive operations. Their defensive operations are major, majority of the time, they're all failures, which is surprising. It really is. Because you think about the like Boston, that's an offensive operation. It's a siege. They succeed yeah. there. Trenton, Princeton, they succeed. Uh, you could say Assunpink Creek as a defensive opera or battle is a success. Yeah. New York, that's all defensive and failures. Then during the Philadelphia campaign, Germantown is a failure, but it still is a hard hitting, you know, they, they pack a punch before yeah. they fail. And like you said, Washington more so failed them uh, than the army there, but Brandywine defensive battle, it's a failure. Uh, Mammoth, you know, it begins as an offensive operation. They're the ones who strike the British, not the other way around. And then it turns into a defensive battle on their part. But mm -hmm. by then, uh, you know, the die's already been cast of that. And, and Clinton doesn't plan on turning it really into an offensive battle. Um, but then after that, we don't really see any more big battles between the main Continental Army and the main British Army operating around New York City. So really Brandywine, Germantown and Monmouth are the last big pitch battles we see of these armies during the war. And there's still a lot of war left too. 
You're absolutely, I mean, I can't really argue with anything you just said. I, I would have to agree with everything you just said because after that, it, it's Yorktown because yeah, everything absolutely. everything shifts to the south and yeah. Washington's not down there until the very end. I mean, besides that, yeah, the smaller engagements, I mean, uh, this quick hit and strike things you see in the what, Hudson Highlands and uh, Stony Point or uh, Verplank Point and, and so forth. But um, so after, so go, moving on to, that's a great point uh, by Billy too. I mean, it is, um, uh, is it harder to, um, to plan for defense than it is for, uh, is that where Washington's outmatched as a journal? Because defense, you, you're relying on to, a set piece, and that's the one thing that he wants to avoid. Um, because I mean, uh, the army maybe can handle it. You always, we always hear about the army not being able to handle it, can't fight the British toe by toe. But I mean, there are certain actions where they do exactly that. And I mean, Brandywine, besides Sullivan's division being caught in transition from column to line, which I mean, I don't care any war, any battle, any unit, you get caught in that transition. Veterans will have, will break. I mean, because it's you lose cohesion. But I mean, the two divisions that are there on the field that are in line trade shots with the British, don't they? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, you guys, I don't, I can't really fault anything you guys are saying. Um, you know, and every time he has to fight a defensive battle, whether it be up around New York or Brandywine, he's kind of forced into that. Um, you know, politically, he's forced into that. You know, I don't think he wants to fight a defensive battle, which is why he's always looking for that opportunity to strike. Um, I mean, he got really lucky at Trenton. I mean, he got really lucky at Trenton. Um, but Germantown is basically an, another Trenton plan. Let's take four columns and come in on four different roads and strike them. I mean, they were supposed to hit Trenton with four columns, but two of them never made it across the river. So... Okay. I'm sorry, one could argue that as soon as, I mean, he launches the attack at Germantown, and which will be, we we'll guarantee we'll have Mike back uh, if he's willing to talk about that. Uh, but once he launches the attack at Germantown, he's technically, I mean, unless it's a complete route, has kind of won a, a big picture victory because, I mean, it does play very high in the French foreign ministry that, well, I mean, for any line happened September 11th, less than a month later, the army is still ready to attack. But I mean, uh, I think too, I mean, Washington, uh, understand, I mean, as um, I think it was Napoleon once said, what, a lucky general is better than a uh, good general. And I mean, Washington um, is lucky, but the big picture too is, I mean, you see with defensive and hate to bring the civil war back into this. But I mean, after Fredericksburg, Lee is very distraught because it's not a, a good victory. Um, the union goes back. Washington maybe a little bit, and I'm throwing this out there as conjecture, but um, it's easy to, when you strike a Trenton Princeton to build morale, to build public support, to get what you need, funding, and it's that quote-unquote sexy victory. Look at offensive attack, look what we got. A defensive victory, a lot harder to maintain discipline in a line when here's the British coming at you, and it's the most formal force, the biggest empire in the world, and, it, and if you win or lose, what's the tactical victory that you get, or what's the big victory picture after that besides the tactical? So, um, that's just my two cents throwing it out for uh, um, Billy and uh, Mike here. You guys know a lot bigger experts on the uh, Red War than I am. So um, just throwing it out there for uh, food for fodder. Is that po uh, possibly, I mean, Washington's genius is he's a better big picture general than tactical general. Um, I'd say uh, uh, tacti tactically speaking, um, Washington fighting a defensive battle uh, you really, it, there's a lot of guessing involved, as with Brandywine, and Washington guessed wrong, as he guessed wrong with many battles uh, that his army was forced to fight on the defensive with. You, you kind of have to be several steps ahead of your enemy because they are the ones who hold the cards as the attacking force, not you. So you kind of have to have all, um, you know, tenants of their plan in your head and be able to realize like that you might need to adjust on the fly and also be thinking about the possibilities, the alternatives of what the enemy can do. But Washington is not really good at doing that. Like we were talking about with Chad's Ford, he's just, he's committed to that's where the main attack is going to be made. He's not going to get outflanked again. Like you said, he had been three or four times beforehand and he guessed wrong and his army paid for it. Um, but again, when, when Washington is, is launching these offensives, he has all the cards in his hand. You know, he's the one with the initiative. So he's a much better offensive minded general when he catches his, his opponent kind of off guard 
rather than sitting back and with what how's or in uh, regard to William Howe, uh, he really does kind of fling Washington around like a rag doll when he does actually attack him. Uh, yeah. But Howe is, of course, cautious and, and loses a lot more opportunities uh, than he gains them. You know, I, I get this question a lot when I'm out, um, you know, speaking, when I get asked to speak somewhere. And, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like I'm anti-Washington because, you know, there's a reason he's a great president. There's a reason we win the war. It's not the battlefield. I mean, we could we can argue that, you know, till the moon, you know. <laughs> but he the the greatness of Washington is through all the bad stuff that army went through, through all the trials it went through, it that army does not collapse. And the army is the symbol of the war. Because without the army, there is no war. Because the government's inept. That Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation they're gonna create are a horrendous form of government. So if the army had collapsed, the government would have collapsed. So the fact, and you know, if that government was so good, why did we have to write a constitution? I mean, um, so, you know, if that's why Washington's great, it's what makes him a great president. The fact he kept it together through all his mistakes, through all the bad stuff that was put on his plate, that's what I, that's, you know, when I get that question out, that, that's my argument. That's why he's great. You know, yeah. I, I just don't think he's good on a battlefield. And on the other side, uh, like you said, the, the army is what's keeping the cause alive. And that seems to be the one thing that the British could not recognize, especially William Howe. You know, rather than just continuously pounding away at Washington's army, he has his, his sights set on New York City. He has his sights set on Philadelphia. He thinks tacking the so, so-called political and economical capitals of the, uh, the, the United States, uh, that that's going to end the war. But it doesn't because Washington's army just falls back and recovers. The Continental Congress just retreats to York and continues business as usual when Philadelphia falls. So these big, what he thinks should be the, the deciding engagements of the war, uh, they really do not. And, and that's Howe's greatest downfall too, because I think he, he was a very good general. And as we see on the battlefield, uh, he takes advantage of this opponent at every opportunity he's given. I mean, one, one of the things I don't understand about the revolution, because I've done a lot of, when I was doing my graduate work, I did a lot of research on how the British developed tactics in the French and Indian War to deal with the North American continent uh, and warfare on the North American continent. And then why, what I don't grasp is they changed all their concepts, they, they redeveloped their light infantry, they came up with all new tactics but it's like when the revolution begins, they like scrapped all that. They had such a discontent for American militia dating back to the French and Indian War that I think they were just convinced that they could push them aside and ignore every, all the lessons they had learned in the French and Indian War. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I, I still can't get my head around when I think about British tactics, um, um, both in the Saratoga campaign and, and the Philadelphia campaign. I don't understand why they don't use the, the, the lessons and the manuals they created after the, Fr the French and the war to deal with the North American continent because you couldn't win a European war. But, you know, getting to your point, ca capturing cities meant nothing. Yeah. That's a European war. So, I, you know, I, it's just one of those things that drives me, my mind crazy when I stop and think about it. <laughs> Especially how mm -hmm. itself. I mean, how sees what the militia can do early on at Breed's Hill or Bunker's Hill. I mean, where they, in a fixed position, I mean, just mow down the British regulars coming up the hill. And I mean, <laughs> and, um, not getting too much into what ifs, I mean, it might actually help the Continental Cause if the Continental Congress was captured in 1777, because, I mean, Washington would have to deal with the Board of War and all that in 1777, uh, during the winter of Valley Forge. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, you see the, I mean, that conventional uh, war, I mean, it's, it's even, how has always been, for two guys, for me, it's, I always call like got Chase Landers was Thomas Gage before the war because I mean what he puts up with with the North American rebels. I mean he basically holds off a war as long as he can. I mean they're basically yeah. doing everything they can to to spite him. And then William Howe, I mean who has and understands the American psyche. I mean he lost an older brother fighting here in the French and Indian War. Um, I think he helps write some of the manuals if I'm not wrong, or at least as part of it. And then I mean, here and and completely, I mean, I, I feel like he, they say, if you're pulled into uh, uh, what the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I mean, he's a political advisor trying to do peace in New York, but fight at the same time, but not fight too hard. So, I mean, 
it's got it, it's this poor guy. I mean, it just pulled in in his mindset too many directions and taking that conventional gentleman war. I mean, oh, winners. I mean, I, I don't understand why Valley Forge he doesn't strike something, knowing that Washington would it does the same thing the winter before and learn that lesson of uh, that this is not a conventional war. But I mean, obviously, I get the comforts of Philadelphia, and we're not going to get into the mistresses. And well, he that. also he he also resigned. Uh, he resigned. He resigns pre Valley Forge. What is it? October, November, right? It's, uh, it's it's either late October, fall. early November. It's the fall. Yeah. It's after Germantown. So at that point, I don't think he cares. Like he just wants to go home. Like he he his effort. You know, kind of goes out the window at that point. I mean, rightfully so. He's now got to defend his reputation when he gets back to London and answer to uh, uh, Jermaine and and those uh, and the, and the cabinet or whatever the Parliament of what. Yeah, he, what he's qu he's questioned before Parliament when he returns home. In fact, his all we the only um, interesting uh, research issue, um, let, Hal's personal letters don't exist. They um, and I I get the two of them confused. They were either burned in a house. <laughs> or his wife burned him after he died. I get him and Cornwallis mixed up, but they were burned is the point. So we I don't know his, we don't know his personal thoughts. So the only, the only stuff we have on him is his official reports to Germain and his testimony before parliament when he returned home. I think it's his, uh, it's his wife. I think Cornwallis' wife dies, what, in 17, late 1770? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And Cornwallis, right. I think, dies in India. Um, yes, that's correct. Time. So I think yeah, it's Hal's wife that, um, Pulls to Washington, burns all the all the correspondence. So uh, Hal and Washington are more connected than, than we thought. Yeah. But, um, um, before we, uh, I don't want to leave this to the end because we got a great question from one of our top fans, Jim Walsh. It says, uh, "What responsibility did Washington's war councils hold? I understand ultimately it's his call, but did these war councils fail Washington? Um, did he have one at Brandywine?" Ooh, no, not at Brandywine. He doesn't have one at Brandywine, but there's a lot during the campaign. Um, that's a good question. It makes me, I gotta stop and think about how I want to answer that. Uh, Billy, um, you want to weigh in here while he uh, takes a moment? It is proverbial that councils of war never fight, says Henry <laughs> Halleck. But um, yeah, I mean, during the Monmouth campaign, from my research with that, Washington holds probably half a dozen councils of war, and they all basically say, don't fight until Washington takes it upon himself to say, we're going to bring on a battle. Uh, so I think he does rely a little bit too much on his counts as a war rather than making the decisions himself. Definitely. They hold it, which is, which is fine. Um, it's good that he, he respects the uh, opinions of his subordinates, but still as a commanding general, uh, sometimes you need to take matters into your own hands. Yeah. I don't disagree. With that. I'm trying to think, cause I'm trying to think all the ones, cause there's a bunch of them in my Germantown book. And every time they say no, until they finally give him the okay to go to Germantown. Um, and you could argue the, decision whether or not to assault Cliveden is another council of war in the heat of battle um, mm -hmm. where I think they got their, they, they got that one wrong um, yeah I I would say the only one I can think of that says attack is the one the, the day before they issue the orders for the march to Germantown I can't think of another one that says go attack yeah yeah um, it's usually like the, the, the same officers under his command will always urge him to attack, but they're usually uh, outvoted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it's that, always the ones that don't know what they're talking about, too, like the militia commander. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony Wayne, a lot of the times, too. Yeah, he's always you Anthony attack. Wayne on that side. Um, I mean, I think he's, he's always ready to attack something or somewhere. But um, so uh, as we. Um, let's. Uh, so, Brandywine, uh, the numbers involved for people that. Um, have not, for some unknown reason, read your book. Um, and I, I can't understand why they wouldn't and tune into this, uh, but so they better read it afterwards. Um, <laughs> what uh, the numbers have evolved to casualties? Um, uh, what's the, uh, I mean, percentage or, or numbers? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, trying to remember all the time. Washington's got about 16,000 troops, give or take. And then of that, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's 300 killed, 600 wounded, I think 400 captured or missing, I think is what that number is. The British have give or take 15,000, and they are 93 killed, I think it's 488 wounded and like nine missing. I might be a little off on them, but it's pretty close to what the numbers are. 
Man, that's a, I mean, tremendous amount of wounded being scattered in a small area. I mean, I think Cajal even asked for Washington to send surgeons into the lines to take, take care of some of the wounded. So, I mean, well, what's, uh, your, what's your definition of a small area? I mean, uh, how far, I mean, maybe, I'll, okay, maybe I'm wrong. How far in the Southeast Pennsylvania, I mean, do the wounded get scattered? 10 square miles. 10 square miles. So, yeah. um, and are any of these buildings still available to, to see? I mean, are, how many? Um, no, that's a good question. Some are, yeah, some are. Um, so a lot of them end up initially at, um, there's a couple of uh, prominent Quaker meeting houses on the battlefield, one in Kennett, which is on US Route 1 today, and one on uh, uh, sort of on the south slope of Birmingham, or no, north slope of Birmingham Hill, the Birmingham Meeting House. They both become hospitals after the battle. And then there was dozens of houses in the area. Um, there's probably three or four that are still in existence. Um, now the ones that are like sort of public, the meeting houses are obviously public buildings. They're still used by the Quakers. Um, and then there's mass burials in both those cemeteries. Um, there's also a lot of mass burials in private farms still. Um, yeah, so. So we, uh, so we didn't get too much into the campaign, but uh, I mean, if uh, Mike's okay with it, we'll go a few minutes after uh, eight o'clock. Um, or if, if Billy's okay with it too, um, I don't want to, it's a history yeah, conversation. Right. I don't want to hold you guys to it. So, um, but uh, so the campaign. So, what 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 is the next step after Brandywine? Um, so a lot of maneuvering. Um, Washington retreats that night to Chester, uh, which is on the Delaware River. Then the next morning marches, um, sort of bypasses Philadelphia out to the Germantown area, before recrossing the Schuylkill River. And that sets them up for the Battle of the Clouds on September 16th, which is the same day the British leave the Brandywine battlefield. So that's five days later. Then um, Washington, because of the ruin of the ammunition in that rainstorm, has to retreat farther to the Northwest to get a resupply. Um, during that time, and while Washington's maneuvering, he leaves behind Anthony Wayne's division. That's how you get the Battle of Paoli on September 21st. Then um, you got some, there's a minor skirmish um, on September 18th at Valley Forge, which most people don't know about because everybody thinks Valley Forge is the winter encampment, but there was actually a little fight there on September 18th, uh, the Battle of Valley Forge. <laughs> um, but that's all part of the maneuvering to get across the Schuylkill by the British. They crossed the Schuylkill on the 20. Fourth, I think it is, and then occupy Germantown on the 25th and occupy Philadelphia on the 26th. Washington um, slowly waiting for reinforcements, inching closer. Battle Germantown then is October 4th. Then there's all kinds of actions along the Delaware River because the British can't get their ships into the city to resupply. So Washington's trying to maintain these forts. There's a, um, an action at a place called Billingsport in South Jersey, a really little known action. Um, that's actually right before the Battle of Germantown. I think it's the 2nd of October. It's either the 2nd or the 3rd, it's right before Germantown. Um, then there's a massive assault on a New Jersey fort called Fort Mercer on October, I think it's 22nd. Um, and that fails. Hessians are, are, are repulsed. Carl von Donop is mortally wounded, and they hold that fort. Um, in the middle of all that, there's a siege of Fort Mifflin on the Pennsylvania side. Eventually, the guys in Fort Mifflin just can't hold out any longer. And in mid-November, in the middle of the night, they, the, the survivors evacuate to the New Jersey side. There's some minor um, other engagements and, and expeditions in New Jersey. The last major action is a place called White Marsh which is uh, just northwest of Germantown on December, I think that's the 7th. Yeah, I think it's the 6th to 8th, or yeah, the 7th. Yeah, that sounds eight, right, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the new book. I haven't got that for you. <laughs> um, and then ultimately Washington marches in the Valley Forge, which I think is December 20th or 21st, might be. Is he Nin marching? Uh, 19th, is he going? Uh, that's close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, so is a, I, I'm, 
preempting your uh, new book, uh, apparently, because I uh, just wrote one for the ERW series about Valley Forge. So it's just introductory to get them. So um, it, uh, when we do a, a re-edition of it, we'll say Michael Harris's new books are the ones you need for the more detailed. No, um, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking to do a book on Valley Forge. I want to I need a, I want to get a third volume that covers all the operations from Germantown to Valley Forge. Okay. So... But yeah. uh, for White Marsh, so I'll just tell for more information on White Marsh. There it is. Um, yeah. It um is there. Yeah. It's uh I think the eight six yeah, six to the eighth or eight through the ten something yeah, that, that sounds um, something like that. Yeah. But uh yeah I mean it um and we did have someone at Fort Mifflin um across um you have some great characters that are hit um you decided you said Don up who's mortally wounded I think lose uh shot in the leg or something like that um something like that uh, he died uh, he bleeds yeah. to death like within a day. Yeah, he has uh, a great thing, what he was going to uh, take the fort or die trying or something like that. And, uh, but I think it's a, what, a relative of Nathaniel Green uh, that defends the fort. Uh, Christopher Green. Uh, Christopher Green. And then on the, uh, of course, the other side, in this one, I think you have the ubiquitous, um, um, who is it? Um, Joseph Plum Martin. Uh, Joseph Plum Martin, yeah. Joseph Plum Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph Plum Martin's he actually said Martin. that comment, the thing went out of my head. Um, yeah, he, Martin's also a Germantown. So. Martin, uh, I mean, amazing, what, 16, 17, 18 year old. He's uh, everywhere. Um, and, yeah, except uh, Brandywine. He's not a Brandywine. Not a Brandywine. So uh, before you uh, leave, the last thing, uh, so we know the implications of Germantown. We've mentioned a little bit, and we don't want to get too far down that road because um, we need Michael back to talk about that book. Um, but what is the lasting implications for Brandywine uh, besides the obvious, the fall of Philadelphia? I actually think I, I, it starts to show that the Continental Army is capable. It's not, it's sort of the germ of its capability, but, you know, when they, when it was a stand-up fight and they weren't out flank, when it was, you know, brigade against brigade, they, they could hold their own for at least a short period of time. So I think you start to see the germ of what's going to fight at Monmouth at Brandywine. Um, it develops even more at Germantown because that's an offensive capability. It, again, we'll, we'll talk about that in the future, but the, what they pull off there in the middle of the night is shocking that they all show up at the same time on four different roads. I mean, that, that's a capable army that does that. Um, but then the formal, I mean, that's all pre-formal training at Valley Forge. So, you know, so when they go in the Valley Forge, you know, they, they weren't, like raw recruits at that point that had to be trained from scratch. So I, I, I think you see the germ of what's going to come out of Valley Forge at Brandywine. Really? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot with the Valley Forge training, it was more so not teaching them to be soldiers alone, but teaching them to be soldiers together on a battlefield. Um, and yeah, I mean, Brandywine itself, it's, it's a very, very important and bloody battle of the war. And a lot of people, they, they don't know about it. Um, and I think that's because it's how the war ended and everything turned out to be okay. So it was essentially no harm, no foul. But like you were saying, it definitely was. And a lot of the British who fought at the battle and, and the Hessians as well were, did compliment how well the Americans stood up and fought there. And again, later on at Germantown, and even when we're, we're negotiating with the French uh, after Saratoga, Germantown is one of the battles that they bring up. Saying that they really commended the efforts of the Americans. We did look like a, a hard-hitting professional army there that could stand toe to toe. So this, this, yeah, this army of you know of, of rab rebels is really turning into uh, a hardened group of veterans by this point. And, and like Mike was saying, you, it really is the beginning of the army that we see at Monmouth um, the next year, as well as the end of the war or through the end of the war. But I do have one quote here that I love. We were talking about Fort Mifflin. And this is by far one of my favorites, Thomas Paine quotes throughout the entire war. He writes an open letter after Fort Mifflin falls uh, to General William Howe. And he says, the garrison with scarce anything to cover them but their bravery survived in the midst of mud, shot, and shells. And were at last obliged to give it up more to the powers of time and gunpowder than to the military superiority of the besiegers. And he con uh, concludes it with, you are fighting for what you can never obtain, and we are defending with what we never mean to part with. <laughs> That's a good one. Get your patriotic uh, juices flowing. <laughs> and uh, because, uh, so one last question for, uh, for you, Mike, before we do end here. Um, someone asks, where did the Continent Army house the British soldiers after capture? Any of those did capture? Um, 
million dollar question. Then, I don't think I have an answer. So after after Trent and Princeton, those prisoners end up in Reading, near actually not far from where I live. Um, there was a huge prisoner of war camp outside of Reading, Pennsylvania, because there was a, a large German speaking population um, around that area at the time. So uh, the communication wasn't a huge issue for all those Hessian prisoners. Be honest with you, there is not a lot captured during this Philadelphia campaign from like British troops captured. So if I had to guess if there were any captured, because I haven't really come across in the records like a discussion of it. They probably are in Reading too at the time. Now I know the Saratoga prisoners end up at Fort Frederick in Maryland. The, um, uh, the conventional army or, or yeah, another, the conventional yeah. army when they don't exchange them or ship them back to Europe, they end up in Western. They end up in like West Virginia, Western Maryland, the Shenandoah Valley, because again, that German-speaking population yeah. for all those, you know, yeah. Yeah, they end up, uh, even some of them as far down almost as Charlottesville, I think. I think William Phillips and everything ends up down there. Yeah. Um, but, um, so we had a, yeah, a great question um, and, uh, from Robert Ryan, so I wanted to include it before uh, we conclude it here. But um, if you, uh, we'll have Mike back again, uh, hopefully here in a few weeks, uh, but we will definitely have Mike back next May for a hindsight 2020. I think you're actually talking uh, about John Sullivan a little farther, so. Yeah. Um, I will put a disclaimer. I uh, that did slip my mind when I asked the question about John Sullivan, but now I look like a genius by sliding that in, promoting <laughs> um, the ER, ERW symposium, which is being held in historic Alexandria in May next year. Uh, it is hindsight 2020, but because of that COVID 19, we decided to move it uh, into 2021. So we can help, hope you can join us. Um, we'll be back next Sunday uh, again for uh, so please tune in again for this Red Bull Reverie. Uh, Billy, Mike, thank you so much for uh, joining us um, to talk history tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys, obviously, uh, on another Zoom here in, in the future. So thanks again. Uh, any last closing remarks before we roll out of here? Well, I'm good. Uh, thank well, you. Gentlemen, uh, thanks again. And um, we, uh, we'll see you guys uh, next Sunday uh, for those who tune in right here again at 7 o'clock for Red War Revelry with Emerging Revolutionary War. <laughs>